All right. Well, hey, good morning, church. Great to see all of you. Hey, I got a question. Have you ever been invited to a weird wedding? Seriously, right? I mean, sometimes there's weird weddings that we end up being at. I don't know. I, I was thinking of the weirdest wedding I ever went to. It was some guy that I knew in high school, still kind of had a relationship with him. And uh, so this wedding, we had to hike into it, okay, first of all. We had to hike into this wedding. It was, it was in the mountains. And, uh, and, and so we hiked literally about a half a mile to get to this outlook. And it was beautiful, beautiful pine trees and, and rocks and then mountain range. I mean, it was, it was really nice, but it was kind of weird. And, um, and so the wedding party is, is all set. And, and the people in the crowd were kind of standing there wondering, you know, guy, this is going to be unique. And then... This uh, man walks in with these flowing white robes, and apparently he was the officiant. He was the minister at the wedding, but he kind of took his time. He, he came in from the side, and, and he stopped at a tree, and he kind of looked at the tree, and we're looking at him, and then he starts to talk with the tree. <laughs> we're saying, okay, I... and then he hugged the tree. And we're thinking, okay, I like trees. He really likes trees, apparently. <laughs> and, and as he was slowly working his way to the front, he stopped, and there was a little squirrel. And he bent down, and he waved at the squirrel. And we're thinking, all righty then. So uh, he finally made it to the uh, wedding party and the, the groom and the, and the bride, and he welcomed all the guests, and he said, I want you to know that the gentle tree people are glad that you're here today. <laughs> and the four-footeds and the two-wingeds also welcome you into their home. And I thought, groovy. Oh. <laughs> and, and then he said, he said, and whether... Whether you follow God or Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad, it doesn't matter. We're all here to connect with Mother Earth. And then he went on for, uh, for the wedding ceremony. And, and, I, and after the wedding, and people were greeting each other, my friend came up and he said, so what would you think of the, of the wedding ceremony? <laughs> And I said, I think we need to talk about Jesus when you get back from your honeymoon. That's what I think. <laughs> you know, so, uh, boy, it's more common than you think, right? Kind of getting Jesus wrong. And I was thinking about all the different major religions in our world and what they teach about Jesus. You know, there's, there's 1.9 billion Muslims in our world. 1.9 billion. And... They don't see Jesus as God. They see Jesus as a good prophet, less than the prophet Muhammad, but a, a good prophet, but certainly not God, not Allah. There are 16 and a half million Mormons, and the Mormons don't really see Jesus as God either. They see Jesus as the firstborn of the heavenly father and the heavenly mother, and if you really dig into their doctrine, Jesus is actually a spirit brother of Satan, of Lucifer. And, and he is our spiritual elder brother in the teachings of Mormonism. Well, there are 14.7 million adherents to Judaism. And their scriptures are our Old Testament. And of course, they've rejected Jesus as God's awaited Messiah for their lives. And then finally, there are the Jehovah's Witnesses. There's about eight and a half million of them. And again, in their theology, Jesus is not God. And if you get uh, uh, more, uh, take a closer look at their beliefs, Jesus is actually the Archangel Michael. And that's uh, who they believe. He was the first created being of God. So if you have your note sheets, this is where. We're going to start. It's a common problem in our world, uh, making Jesus less than who he 
really is. And that's why we've entitled this whole series through the book of Colossians, Greater Than. That's why you see these symbols on your programs and on the stage. Paul is trying to make the case in the book of Colossians that following Jesus, you have to realize he's not just another deity, not just an idol god, not just another philosophical thought. Jesus is greater than all of that. He is, in fact, the Lord God, creator of the universe and savior of our souls. And so when Paul hears about these false teachers that had come in to this little church in this insignificant town of of Colossae um, in modern-day Turkey, when he heard from their pastor, a guy by the name of Epaphras, that these false teachers were coming in and uh, teaching a doctrine of Jesus that was less than, that degraded the full lordship and deity and humanity of Jesus Christ, the apostle was concerned. And so he took the time in his prison cell, he was in prison at that time for preaching Jesus, to write them a letter. And to emphasize the greatness of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to read to you our passage today. If you have your Bibles or you've got it on your phone or somewhere, you might want to get to Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read to you verses 15 to 23. And I'm going to replace the pronouns he and him with who they're referring to, Jesus And I think that'll give you a little bit better understanding of what Paul is talking about. So it says this, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And Jesus is before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything Jesus might be preeminent. For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of Jesus' cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by Jesus' death in order to present you holy and blameless. And above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, am a minister. Probably one of the greatest statements of who Jesus is in all of the New Testament. We're going to look at that today. And how do we respond as his followers? How should everyone respond to the greatness of God's Son, Jesus Christ? We're going to look at that this morning. But before we do, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for bringing us here into this place where your word tells us where two or three are gathered, there am I also. Lord, we welcome your Holy Spirit amongst us as we proclaim the name of your Son, Jesus. Impact our minds today that we might learn. Impact our hearts that it might change us and impact our hands and feet that it might make a difference in the way we live. In your son Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? 
Amen. All right. So let's get going, church. Well, how do we respond to the greatness of, of Jesus? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to understand who Jesus is. Now, all of us have that basic understanding. Well, yeah, Jesus, he's, he's the son of God, and he, he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and he, and he rose again on the third day, and that's really good. Paul goes a little bit deeper in Colossians chapter 1, and the first thing that he, that he points out is that, is that to understand Jesus, you have to realize he's the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He starts off in, in verse 15 that he is the image of the invisible God. That word image means the exact representation of God the Father. You've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father, is what Paul is saying. Now, we've all heard that impression, right? Uh, he's a chip off the old block, like father, like son, right? In my case, it's like mother, like daughter in our home, okay? My daughter, Sophia, she, she was actually playing keyboards here this morning, just like her mom, just like her mom. You know, I mean, she's, she's beautiful, she's tall, she's smart, and she's got all those wonderful qualities that her mom has as well, okay? <laughs> just like her mom, all right? Just like her mom. And, uh, and that's awesome. She is a very close represent. I call her, I say, hey, I tell my wife, where's your mini-me? <laughs> Where is she? Where's your mini-me? Oh, there she is, you know, representation. Now, this image language, uh, we, we find it in... In the very first chapter of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, during the creative process, it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that God said, let us make man, and God's not talking to himself here, okay? Let us, that's a plural, that's the trinity, right in, in, in creation, in the first chapter of the Bible, you've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God said, let us make man in what? In our image, after our likeness. Wow. Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he was telling them about God the Father, and he was telling them about about heaven, and, uh, and one of his disciples got a little confused, Philip, and, and so it says in John chapter 14, verse 8, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, just show us the Father, and that's enough for us. So Jesus is just trying to explain to them who God the Father is, what heaven's going to be like, and one of his disciples, Philip, goes, I tell you what, you know, just, just show us God. Jesus, just show us God, that'll be enough. You can stop talking. <laughs> We'll believe you. Just show us the Father. And Jesus gets a little frustrated with this guy. All right? And, and Jesus, you, you got to get the emotion into it. Verse 9, Jesus said to Philip, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? I think Jesus is saying, get a clue, son. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. You've seen me, Philip. Seeing me, you've seen God, the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Go take a time out. I'm done with you right now. Right? Jesus himself realized, I am the image of God, the Father. Secondly, Jesus is supreme over all creation. He's firstborn. The Bible tells us in Colossians 1.15, he's firstborn of all creation. Now, when you hear that word, firstborn, don't think physical birth. Don't think uh, birth order necessarily. Instead, think of the word status. Jesus is firstborn over all creation in status. Paul is referring to his pre-existent eternity with God, as God, before creation even existed. And he goes on, and it says in, in Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 17, for by Jesus, or for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. And then he talks about spiritual forces, whether good or bad, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus and for him. In Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold 
together. I kind of love watching those, uh, those shows on TV, those documentaries about space and about creation. And, and they talk about how, you know, gases and, and, and uh, a little bit of matter all, all formed together in the beginning. And there was this big bang and the universe was created. I'm all like, that's great. That's how God did it. That's cool. I'm glad science has caught up with that. They're starting to understand God's ways. And it talks about, you know, Jesus is, is holding the universe together. And there's all these scientific theories. I believe it's the power and the design of God to hold his creation together through the creative force of his creation, who is the Son, Jesus Christ. He's the super glue of the universe, all right? That's Jesus. He's, he's God. Um, in the book of John, another writer, um, one of the followers of Jesus, one of the Disciples, it tells us in John chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, that Jesus was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Jesus. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. So the Bible, are you getting the point here? Jesus is supreme over all creation. When I was a little kid, my parents used to take us on vacation every summer to Yosemite. And as we were entering Yosemite, you'd have to go through a tunnel, the Wawona Tunnel, right? And when you're a little kid, you try to hold your breath all the way through the tunnel. You ever try to do that? Are your kids, right? The tunnel's coming. You know, we're, we're trying to hold our breath, and you're looking at your brother. And we're holding our breath. And it's like, boom, we let it go. We get out of the tunnel, and that's what you see. Bam! I mean, that is one of the most beautiful views of all God's creation. I'm convinced of it. You come in and you have this view of, of, of Yosemite Valley. You've got Bridalvale Falls on the right. You've got El Capitan. You've, you've, got, you've got this beauty. And you've got Yosemite Falls. And then you go on and, and there's Half Dome. And, uh, and, and if you go to Yosemite, they'll tell you how the valley was carved through glaciers and how the water came and, and the, the valley became flat and, and how the forests grew and the, the granite sheer cliffs and how it was made. And you've got El Capitan as the largest piece of granite in the world and you've got the beautiful Merced River and, and if you go on the nature hikes they'll tell you how all the, all the science comes together and I love learning all that stuff but here's what I do I will often just go down by the river and I'll look up at, at just the waterfalls and at Half Dome and the cliffs and I worship I worship because I know that God is behind the glaciers. God's behind the, 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 the forestry. God's behind the biology and the botany in the creative force of his son Jesus, who is supreme over all creation. Amen. We understand Jesus by understanding that he's the head of the church. Paul goes on to say uh, in verse 18 in the first part of it, and Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Now, Paul is trying to remind the Colossians, these pretty young believers, that hey, don't allow anybody to devalue Jesus, all right? He's the chief of his church. He's the source of the church. Matter of fact, he's the head of the church. Without Jesus, there's no church, I've seen people walking around without arms. I've seen people walking around without legs or hands or, or even a foot or toes or fingers or an ear. I've never seen anybody walking around without a head. And if you do, it's probably Halloween, right? Listen, Jesus is the head of the church. Without Jesus, you don't got a church. I don't know what we are without Jesus. A big YMCA meeting? I have no clue. We're some type of an encounter group, you know, uh, and I'm some sort of a motivational speaker. You know, I don't know. But without Jesus, we're not the church, folks. All right? 
Paul is making the argument, he's the head. It's about Jesus. We look to Jesus. See, the false teachers in Colossae were, they were devaluing Jesus. They were saying that Jesus was, was never even mortal, that he was simply um, this spiritual emanation. He was one of many intermediaries between man and God. And Paul's getting right on that. He's saying, I don't think so. You've been taught wrong. You're being influenced in a, in a dangerous way. Get back to your roots. Get back to the truth that Pastor Epaphras taught you, which he got from me when I started the church in Ephesus. Number four, to understand who Jesus is, you got to realize he's the first born from the dead. In other words, his resurrection is the source of, of new life. Paul goes on and in verse 18, he says that Jesus, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. First, number one, Jesus' resurrection, he, he was the beginning. He was, he was the example, he was the model, because Jesus defeated physical death and went to be with the Father, he did that for you and me. So now, we only have to experience a physical death, but our spirits go to be reunited with God in heaven for eternity. Jesus was the first born from the dead, the preeminent source of God's saving work for the whole world. And Jesus understood this about himself he said in John chapter 11, verse 25, he was talking to Martha, and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. That's right from the, the mouth of our Lord, folks. That's good news. Right? We're all going to die a physical death. Uh, we, we don't get out of that. In scripture we're all going to die physically at one point however when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus because he rose from the dead we're going to rise from the dead too and we'll be with Jesus forever and finally we under we need to understand about Jesus his two natures fully God and fully man now the false teachers were saying that Jesus wasn't mortal. They looked down on things that were mortal. But Jesus, he, he was more like a, like a, he was like a God-like being, not God, the true God. He, he was more like an angel. And he, he had this special spiritual knowledge that was really cool. And if you connected with Jesus, you might also learn about that special spiritual knowledge, but there were other ways to get to God. There were other ways to be self-spiritually realized, not just Jesus. Paul wants the Colossians to understand Jesus' true nature. He's fully God, but at the same time, he was fully man. And so, Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, he says, For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's his deity. Don't miss that. That's the deity of Jesus. Within Jesus, God the Father completely dwelled. Because Jesus is God, was God, always has been God. God eternal. The Father dwelling within him. However, because humankind had a sin problem, the second person of the Trinity, again, eternal, preexistent God, took on our flesh. And for 33 years lived and walked as a human being 
on this earth. <laughs> I, used, I used to tell the teenagers, it's kind of God in a bod, right? Jesus was God in a bod. He never stopped being God when he was on this earth for 33 years. And he was fully human, just like you and I, tempted, tried, tested, tired, you name it. He experienced it, yet he was without sin. He experienced our humanity, and only one that could experience our humanity could fully die for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus was the God-man. So those are some things to understand about Jesus. And the more we understand about him, hopefully that will draw us closer to him, and it will also help us understand when somebody is feeding us a different version of Jesus that isn't biblical. And that's how we grow as followers of Jesus. We understand who he is and his person, and his character, his work, and his ministry. There's a second way to respond to Jesus' greatness, and that is thank Jesus for reconciling us to God the Father. You know, we've all experienced conflict in our lives, right? But, you know, there are some people that just seem to be in conflict with everyone. You ever come across people like that? Man. I remember Jarrett. I've talked to you a little bit about him in the past. Jarrett was about 40 years old when I first met him. I was in my early 20s. And Jarrett came to volunteer to work with the high school students that I was leading. And I remember Jarrett sitting down and sharing with me his story. And he said, when I was in my 20s and 30s, he said, man, I was, I was a bad dude. He said, I got mixed up with a, the wrong crowd. I was in a motorcycle gang. And before I knew it, I was dealing drugs for the gang. And then, because I was tough, they made me an enforcer. And I've, I've been in more fights than I can even tell you. He said, I was violent. I sent people to the hospital on a regular basis. He said, I think I even killed someone, but I'm not sure. I said, wow. He said, and then, in one of my stints in prison, I just, I was broken. I had enough. I had hit rock bottom. And at that point, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. And I knelt down, and I trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He said, I got to tell you, Jim, I was in conflict with my family. I was in conflict with <laughs> other gang members. I was in conflict with the general public. I was in conflict with the law. I was in conflict with God. I was in conflict with myself. But when I humbled myself before King Jesus and trusted him and him alone for my salvation, I was free. And I was forgiven. And I, I can't tell you how grateful I am that Jesus has reconciled me with God. I now have peace with others. I have peace with myself. And most importantly, I have peace with God. Paul emphasizes the reconciling work of Jesus with us, with the Colossians, how Jesus' work on the cross made peace between us and God. And so Paul goes on in, in, first, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. He says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, you Colossians, that's how you lived. For some of us, maybe that's how we lived. Maybe for some, that's how we're living now. But then verse 22, he says, but now Jesus has reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. You see, the Colossians had believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying that that is great news. And he's reconciled you now before God because of the cross. And now he has made you what? Holy 
That means that everybody that puts their trust in Jesus to save them, we are set apart unto God. We are sacred unto God. We're holy. And we are, we're blameless, Paul says. When we trust in Jesus as our Savior, something really awesome happens. And this might blow your mind, but just as in Adam, as in Adam and Eve, because he sinned, we kind of received his, his sin, that doctrine of original sin. That's why we have a sin nature. That's why we, we're tempted. That's why we mess up and we don't do what God wants us to do all the time. Just like we received that sin nature when we trust Jesus as our Savior, we receive his righteousness. I can't tell you what good news this is. I'm going to tell you, actually, in a couple seconds, all right? But it's awesome. So, so we're blameless, church. And, and, and then he goes on and he, and he says, uh, he says we're above reproach before him. That means that our salvation will not be in question on the day that we stand before God and are judged. That's really awesome. <laughs> let me... Let me picture well let me let me show you what this is what it says it's a little more clear in second corinthians chapter five you got to see this if you don't have this one highlighted or or marked somewhere in your bible or on your phone you got to do this second corinthians chapter five verse 21 says for our sake god made jesus I'm, again, I'm replacing the personal pronouns so we get the, the power of this statement. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin. He took our sin upon him, didn't he, when he died on the cross to forgive us our sins? So that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. That's where that righteousness was transferred to all those who put their trust in Jesus and his death on the cross and resurrection alone for their salvation. Let me put it on the screen for you in a diagram, okay? You've got God, the Father. You have Jesus, the Son, with these arrows. And then you have the believer, those who have trusted Jesus as their Savior. It's kind of, picture it this way. We're standing before God, and the Bible tells us that it is appointed for man to live once and then to face judgment. All of us at some point will stand before God. But as a believer, as a child of God, as someone who has trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when we are judged, our judgment is not whether we're going to go to heaven or hell. Our judgment is based on how we lived our lives in the body. Ours is a judgment of rewards, heavenly rewards. So here's the best way I can picture it for you with that diagram up there. When we're standing before God without Jesus, without, if you're not a Christian and you're standing before God, there's no Jesus, you are being judged by God for everything you ever thought, said, did in life. Once you trust Jesus as your Savior, as the diagram shows, when God looks at us, he has to look through his son first before he sees us. Because we're trusting in Jesus' death on the cross to save us. And when the Father looks through the Son, what does he see? Righteousness. And so when God looks at us, he says, come on in. Come on in. Enter your heavenly rest. Isn't that good news? That's the best news, you guys. It's the best news because so many Christians are trying to earn their way to heaven and, and we get stuck in this try harderism and it doesn't work. You know, come to the church of try harderism, you know, I don't want to go there because I'm going to mess up all the time. I am so thankful, so thankful that that I'm not going to be judged by God on my own righteousness, but based on the righteousness of Jesus. Because my righteousness isn't going to cut it, folks, and neither is yours. Right? So we give thanks. 
And finally, final way to respond to the greatness of Jesus is to remain faithful despite the challenges that we might face. The Colossian church was facing challenges of these other philosophies, these other influences that were saying that Jesus is not all that. He's less than. You don't have the full story, Colossians. And Paul wants them to remain faithful. Listen, life is tough. We know that. Tragedy strikes. Loss occurs. Faith is tested. Pandemics happen. We can get discouraged and frustrated. Doubts and depression can creep in. Our faith can be weakened. Remember what Jesus' half-brother James wrote. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, he said, Count it all joy, my brothers. And he's not ignoring the sisters. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. The Colossians' faith was being tested. But when it's tested, we don't give up. We don't buy whatever everybody's selling. We hold to the truth that we were taught. And that produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Remember, church, Paul is saying to the Colossians, there's no challenge, there's no philosophy, there's no worldview, there's no political persuasion. There's no cultural influence, person or religion that is greater than salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing is greater. No one is greater. And so Paul concludes this section and he says, Now if indeed you continue in the faith, and I believe that he is trusting that they will, He's not trying to make them doubt. He's not trying to scare them. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Paul is saying, remain faithful. Remain steadfast in your knowledge and relationship and commitment to Jesus, no matter how tough it gets. Sometimes when I'm listening to, uh, you know, the music in the car, one of my favorite Christian artists is a young lady by the name of Lauren Daigle. You might like her. She's got a song called You Say. And it's really about, uh, and I'm going to sing it for you now. No, I'm kidding. Uh, But... uh, (laughs) You say No, I'm not going to do that. But I love the lyrics of this song. She's, she's, uh, <laughs> thanks for letting me get goofy up here once in a while. You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. But the lyrics to her song, it's like, she's, she's really communicating, I'm going to remain faithful. No matter what hits me, no matter how I'm feeling, I'm going to remain faithful because you say so. You say that you love me. She goes on, she says, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. You say I'm loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I'm weak. And you say I'm held when I'm falling short. When I don't belong, you say I'm yours, and I believe, oh, I believe, what you say of me, I believe. The only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. In you, I find my worth. In you, I find my identity. Awesome. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes.
So how do we remain strong? Persevere in our faith. It has everything to do with our understanding of who Jesus is. What he's done for us regarding our salvation. And not giving up when questions, doubts, or troubles surface. I want to give you a moment to thank Jesus right now if you're one of his children, one of his followers. Thank him for his greatness. Thank him for what he's done for you. And for some of you, you're realizing, you know, I've never truly trusted Jesus as my Savior. And I feel God calling me to do that right now. If you believe in your heart that Jesus truly is God. And he died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. And he rose again on the third day. The Bible says you will be saved. If you would like to walk out of here today knowing for sure that you're saved, you've never made this decision before, would you just put your hand up and put it down? If you've never made that decision before for Jesus, just put your hand up so I can see. Put it down. Praise God. Pray a prayer like this silently as I pray it aloud. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for me and for dying on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. Lord, I confess them to you now. I thank you for the promise of your Holy Spirit that I receive once I trust in you and for the promise of heaven. Thank you for the power of your resurrection that gives me hope. It helps me live my life that it might be pleasing to you. Thank you for forgiving me and saving me. Amen.